All right. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the very important document put out by Vatican II, probably the most important document that Council did put out, namely the one on the Church, Dogmatic Constitution de Ecclesia. That document we will be talking about next week because it was written to make up for the... Um, do you all know the fancy word lacunae? Holes? <laughs> the holes left in the doctrine on the church by the untimely um, closure of the First Vatican Council. Uh, it wasn't a closure. In fact, Vatican I was never even officially adjourned. Okay. It was summoned by Pius IX, met in 1869, 1870, and then had to be interrupted by the Franco-Prussian War because um, <laughs> the troops of Napoleon III, emperor so-called of the French, were keeping Rome safe from dangerous Italian nationalists. He had to withdraw his troops to fight Prussia in 1870. It was a short war. He lost it quickly. But anyway, um, in 1870, the council had gotten through just two pieces of business and then had to disperse. Okay? And the result of that premature dispersal was that most of what the council, Vatican I, wanted to teach about the Holy Church, its prerogatives, its nature, and so on, never got into print at the Council. Drafts were written, all right? And I'll tell you about those next time. But the texts were never finally approved. Only one part of them was finally approved, namely the part on the supreme uh, pontiff, uh, the, the, the prerogatives and the role and the authority of the Holy See. Okay? Now, at um, Vatican Council I, uh, the famous part of the definition concerns uh, infallibility, of course, but that is only the uh, last portion of the Constitution, uh, Pastor Eternus, it's called, uh, on the Church and on the authority and primacy of the Pope. Um, Pastor Eternus is called the first dogmatic Constitution on the Church of Christ they intended to follow it up with others and didn't get to them. Now, 1870 is um, rather a late date in the temporal perspective of a theologian. Gee, 1870 was the day before yesterday. Um, so you might think that in defining this point that the Pope has a universal primacy of jurisdiction over the whole church, that he is an episcopal superior, so to speak, of every bishop in the church, you might think that this was aimed at reproving conciliarism. Now, does the word conciliarism ring bells? Okay. Let me say a word. Oh, yes, we have a... Oh, look at this. Con. Silly... Oh, oh phooey. With a C. Conciliarism. Yes, indeed. Conciliarism was long dead by 1870. It only had a living shadow, so to speak, an af 
after effect, which I'll get to in a minute. First, let's explain where conciliarism came from and what is its basic claim. The basic claim of conciliarism is that the supreme authority in the church is in the hands of an ecumenical council. Okay? The bishops of the world united together in council, in teaching, are the subject of supreme teaching authority. They have it. And they are the true source of any doctrine that counts as infallible, irreformable, and so on. Well, what, what about the Holy See? After all, if you go back in history and look at the documents of the Council of Ephesus, and then again at the Council of Chalcedon, you see that the fathers of those councils were very free to recognize that they were but subscribing to the truth they had already received uh, from uh, great occupants of the Holy See, like Pope Leo I. However, uh, the uh, Third Council of Constantinople had a problem on its hands which introduced a kind of a wrinkle here. Never mind what the Third Council of Constantinople was all about. You don't want to know about uh, monothelitism, do you? <laughs> it was a harebrained scheme to reunite the churches of the world with the great sea of Alexandria. Okay. How to get the Monophysites in Alexandria back on board with universal orthodoxy it was a project of the Emperor Heraclius, who is a great hero of mine militarily, but who, alas, uh, thought he needed the religious unity of the realm behind him and hence tried this scheme. And he had working for him an Archbishop of Constantinople named Cyril. <coughs> Cyril was smart, very smart. And he drafted up a document that would expound this one will in Christ position. Monothelitism means one will-ism, one will in our Lord. And he wrote it up in such a way and then sent a letter to Pope Liberius in such a way that Liberius said, oh, gee, this is nothing. This is, uh, yeah, sure, I'll sign on. This is a, a quarrel among nitpickers. Well, it wasn't. Liberius had not done his homework, had not thought carefully about the issue, uh, to say the least. And as a result, the Third Council uh, of Constantinople condemned that pope. Okay. Now then, when the acts of this council were reviewed in Rome, the pope did not approve that particular portion of it, that canon, condemning that pope. He approved of it only in part. Okay? He admitted that Vigilius had been, um, Liberius had been careless and inattentive to his duties. Okay? Inattentive to his duties. But he maintained, uh, the pope at the time maintained that this predecessor of his had never actually embraced the heretical position. Okay? But the idea that an ecumenical council could condemn a previous pope gave rise to the idea that the council, a council, if it's ecumenical, rightly called and all that, is in fact superior to the Holy See and can sit in judgment on its occupant. All right? And indeed, that was the understanding of the matter which prevailed in the Eastern Church. As I say, in the Western Church, the Pope did not admit 
that uh, Vigilius uh, was really condemned, only that he was spankworthy for having neglected his duties. And of course, many, many ecumenical councils have been uh, called upon to deal with reform of conduct of churchmen, reform in head and members, it's called. And when you have to preach up reform, you often have to call out uh, ecclesiastical dignitaries and give them at least a verbal spanking because they didn't do their job. All right. That is a very remote source of conciliarism. Let's go to the immediate source. This brings us to um, the first half of the 15th century when your Western Europe was plagued by a schism of its own. This was called the Great Schism of the West and you had at one point three claimants to the papacy. Great doubt as to who was the real one. Nobody saw any way to solve the problem except to call something like a combination of an ecumenical council and a parliament of Europe. It had to also be a parliament of Europe because these papal pretenders, whether they were the real one or not, but these pretenders all had some royal support somewhere. So you needed a political side as well as a theological side to the settlement. All right. At this council, which met in Constance, Council of Constance in Switzerland and also later on at uh, Baal, Basel, a number of the participants did indeed hold the view that this council was the supreme authority in the church in such a way that it could fix the papal problem. Okay? And that it would now be clear that the Holy See would be subject to the review and the judgment of ecumenical councils. Among those holding this opinion and who was in attendance at the Council of Constance was a cardinal named Pierre Dailly. A-I-L-L-Y. I hope I'm, I've got all of his letters in there. Pierre Dailly, uh, cardinal archbishop of a diocese in France called Cambrai. C-A-M-B-R-A-I. He developed a uh, fairly explicitly conciliarist position. All right? Nevertheless, his theology did not prevail at the council. Okay? It was a theory held by some persons active at the council. It was not adopted as an official position of the council. And here's the sense in which the Council of Constance solved the problem of the Great Western Schism. Okay. It did not depose any popes. If you have been told that, forget it. It's false. It did not depose any popes. Okay. The members of the council and the attendant royalty and so on decided that the only way to get progress was to persuade all three claimants to the Roman See to resign. This took some doing, as you can imagine. But eventually, this great task was accomplished. Okay. All three of the claimants, there was a Benedict XIII, uh, there was a uh, Martin V, 
very spiritual. All three of them, there was a Julia, never mind. All three of them were persuaded to resign. Okay? Whereupon, by general agreement, the conclave met and elected a new pope just the way any pope is elected by a conclave. Okay. So what the, the only point of theological importance, it seems to me, that is proved by the Council of Constance is that, yes, a pope can resign. Okay? Sure. If you get tired of the job, you can resign. If there's too much opposition to what, to what you want to do, you can resign. I sometimes feel in my heart greatly saddened that nobody persuaded Paul VI to resign. But I won't get into that. Anyway, um, these guys resigned, the claimants, all resigned. The conclave met. The cardinals elected a pope, okay, who then approved of the work of the council to some extent. And the extent to which he approved it did not include any of the erroneous opinions of Pierre Dailly. All right. Now, rough date, put this around 1450. Okay. And um, years go by. The Protestant Reformation breaks out. Uh, there are huge fights about papal power, right? Waged by the Protestants. And over the course of those centuries, the view that the Holy See is indeed um, uh, succeeding to a primacy given to Peter in that famous statement in uh, Matthew chapter 16. You are Peter on this rock, I will build my church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it, etc., etc. That was a promise of primacy to Peter. And traditionally, the end of St. John's Gospel, where uh, Christ says to Peter repeatedly, do you love me? And he says, yeah. And Christ says, feed my sheep. That's traditionally interpreted as the actual conferral of this promised primacy. Well, these points had become pretty well universal in the Catholic world. And the some kind of superiority of the Holy See over any other body in the church was also pretty well admitted. After all, without the work of the Holy See, uh, reading over councils, calling councils, approving councils, um, there was just too much trouble figuring out what was an ecumenical council and what wasn't. Okay. The Council of Constance was a perfect example of this. Once the participants involved succeeded in getting rid of the antipopes, did they go home? No, no, no. They more or less put themselves into permanent session. And did, continued their deliberations on at the town of Basel. And the Holy See eventually said, this is no longer an ecumenical council. This is junk. <laughs> well, uh, who are you going to... If you leave it up to a council to decide if it is an ecumenical council, you can, you can have the problem that you know, people get together and proclaim themselves an ecumenical council, and they're not. So, the judgment of the Holy See proved to be crucial in this period that was recognized in the, in the debates against the Reformation. And the primacy of the Holy See 
and the importance of the Pope as universal teacher in the church was fully recognized by the greatest of our anti-Protestant theologians. Okay? The man who was a Jesuit with a photographic memory. He was a walking concordance of all the works of St. Augustine. Man was an absolute genius. And he wrote this huge series of controversies with the Protestants, covering every topic, from the canon of Scripture down to, you know, the power of the Pope and uh, the details of the Eucharist and so on. I'm talking about St. Robert Bellarmine. Okay. Bellarmine was a firm defender of the primacy of the Holy See. And I also better tell you one more thing. Bellarmine was a firm defender of what is called the indirect power of the Pope over secular princes. Okay. Indirect power is very different from direct power. There had been medieval popes who maintained that, thanks to the primacy given them by Christ, who is the king of everything, they are themselves the source of all royal power and authority in the world. So kings only reign by their consent, tolerance, whatever. And if the pope wants to depose the king, he deposes him. This theory Bellarmine rejected. Good. It was a very bad theory. The indirect power is of another kind. It says that matters of state, political matters, can come under the judgment of the church by reason of sinful conduct of the prince. Okay? If the prince does wrong, if he injures his subjects, injures his realm, all right, if he does all that, then the church may have a right to intervene and pronounce that the king has sinned. And then it's up to his subjects to decide what to do about it. Right? The Holy See had an interesting precedent going all the way back to the beginnings of the Carolingian dynasty. The last of the old dynasty in France, the Merovingians, uh, apparently a pretty degenerate fellow, wasn't running the country. And certain nobles approached the Holy See and asked if it would be licit for them to depose this guy and turn the realm over to somebody else. Okay. And the Pope at the time said, sure. The Pope did not pretend that he could remove the last of the Merovingians, but he certainly taught that their subjects could remove him. Right? And the implicit doctrine there was that if the king by malfeasance ruptured the implicit contract between himself and the body politic, the body politic could react in such a way as to depose the guy because the king's malfeasance nullified any oath of loyalty which had been taken to the king. Okay? Whether it was a feudal oath or another kind of oath of loyalty. Malfeasance on the part of the superior nullified that. And so you could... You, you know, you, you didn't have to keep a previously made promise, oh, I'll uphold your right to the throne. No, you could act against them and depose them. All right, that was an example of indirect power. All right? The church can advise the prominent citizens of a country that they may in good conscience proceed, proceed against a dictator or a uh, non-functioning head of state. Hmm? 
All right. So much for St. Robert Bellarmine and the consensus that had been reached by the end of the period of the Reformation, the Council of Trent. Papal primacy and indirect power. Now then, why then did there have to be a council held in 1870 to nail these things down again one more time? The answer goes back to the year 1673. Okay? Le Roi Soleil, Louis XIV, okay, decided that his treasury would benefit by extending a custom which was an old one in some dioceses. The custom was that when the bishop died and the see became vacant, the revenues of the see could be collected by the crown. And the crown could dispense uh, benefices and so on, uh, clerical livings and so on, that, that pertain to that diocese, until a new bishop was uh, consecrated and installed. Now, there were good reasons why this custom arose in a handful of places. Many times, dioceses had been set up with so much support from the king that they wanted uh, this arrangement whereby the king would enjoy uh, any revenues when the sea was vacant. Sometimes the problem was that a diocese was set in a nest of rapacious local nobles. Okay. As long as the bishop was alive, he could defend his revenues. But as soon as he was out of the way, local nobles would come in, grab, grab, grab. And so some dioceses said, All right, we know how to get out of this. We'll say that the money goes to the throne. Okay. Then the king will protect our assets. All right? So that was how the custom had come about. This custom, by the way, went under the name of the regale. Uh, the royal right. The regale. Okay. The matter had been reviewed already in the 13th century at the Fourth Lateran Council. Okay. That council had looked over the issue and said, well, it's tolerable that the revenues of a vacancy go to the crown while it is vacant, if that is the custom already in place. But it is not to be introduced anywhere else. Of course not. You can see how dangerous it is. The king's short of cash? <laughs> Bishop in a fat diocese dies? Hey, let's leave it vacant. As long as it's vacant, the cash comes to the throne. <laughs> and Louis XIV was uh, periodically short of cash. And so that finance minister of his, Colbert, persuaded him to take a drastic step in 1673, namely declare that it was an intrinsic part of his royal authority to collect all revenues from all vacant dioceses, whether it had been traditional there or not. Everywhere in the south of France, the regale custom had never been installed. But now, Louis XIV extends it to the south. There was a schism over this. There were bishops who said, no, your majesty, you're not getting the funds when I die. So it was a, a touchy thing. And Louis XIV, uh, he wasn't used to people saying no to him. You know what I mean? And so he was greatly annoyed with Pope Innocent XI. 
Innocent the Eleventh was a very austere fellow of very strong convictions and not about to put up with royal nonsense. He had read what the uh, Lateran Council had, had said. No, it was not Lateran. It was the Second Council of Lyon. Second Council, L-Y-O-N. The Second Council of Lyon. Read what they had said and he... Um, said, no, your majesty, you can't do this. Well, Louis XIV was prepared to have a schism. Okay? Prepared to break with the Holy See. <sighs> so things were delicate. And an attempt at conciliation was made. That attempt was a famous council of the clergy of France. It met in 1682, and it issued four articles. Those were called the Four Gallican Articles. Okay. Setting out the special understanding of the church in France concerning these matters. Aha. Now, I don't want to go on about this forever, because I would like to get to the text of Vatican I tonight. But I have to um, take you through these Gallican articles real quick. The first Gallican article says Peter and his successors, the vicars of Christ, and indeed the whole church has received divine power over spiritual things, but absolutely no power over anything temporal. Okay? Now, if you mean no direct power, sure, we all agree. But the thing goes further than that. It says, we declare as a result that kings and sovereigns are not subject to any church power by divine ordinance in temporal matters. They cannot be deposed directly or indirectly by the authority of the head of the church. Their subjects cannot be dispensed from the vow of obedience to them. And uh, this doctrine is necessary for the tranquility of the realm, and so on and so on. In other words, Gallican Article Number One is a total denial of the indirect power. Okay. This was the other side, the negative side, if you will, of a doctrine whose positive side was the divine right of kings. Okay. The king said, "I am king by a direct ordination of God." Okay. Every bit as much as the Pope is, I in the temporal sphere, he in his. And once an oath had been taken, it could not be broken. Okay. By the way, um, one of the most delicious embarrassments of the Church of England is the fact that they agreed completely with this first Gallican article. Okay. James I already had a divine right of king's theory. And all of the Jacobite kings, uh, Charles I, Charles II, James II, held this view that they ruled by divine right, they could not be deposed, and nothing could dissolve their subjects' oath of obedience. So, when my beloved pal, James II, announced publicly that he was a Catholic, <laughs> the Church of England was stuck with a Catholic head. And uh, you know, he made all kinds of promises how nice he would be and so on, but they couldn't really tolerate it. And so they gave sanction to a thing called the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Okay. I think it was very inglorious, but we won't get into that. 
The fact is, <laughs> the Anglican Church had to eat its doctrine on the, the uh, irremovability of, uh, of, of kings. Okay. That was Article 1. Article 2 says that um, the plenitude of power which the Holy Apostolic See and St. Peter's successors uh, received from Jesus Christ is over um, spiritual matters and is such that the decrees of the Holy Ecumenical Council of Constance, blah, 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 um, uh, preserved in all their force and virtue, and uh, the Church in France does not approve the opinion of those who would weaken the prerogatives of the Holy See. Article 2 was a condemnation of a position called Episcopalism, no relation to Episcopalianism, but Episcopalism, which was more or less Pierre Dailly's idea. Article 3. Here's where things get interesting. The use of the apostolic power that we admit the Pope has, the use of that power must be regulated according to the canons made by the Holy Spirit and consecrated by general respect. So, the idea is that the Holy See can only rule in such a way that what it does is consistent with established canons of what the Holy Spirit allegedly set up in the church. Well, needless to say, we're all going to agree that the Pope's teaching has to be in line with the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course. And, yes, of course, it is a heresy to say, for example, that the, hope, that the Pope could abolish all canon law. That's a condemned proposition. Okay? Just as it would be a heresy to say the Pope could declare every see in the world vacant and rule everywhere in person. Nonsense. Okay? There are things that papal power cannot do. So you would think that that's what this is talking about, but no. No, 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 you have to take it in context. They're talking about the absence of any indirect power. Okay. And so whatever has been set up by custom in lovely times past is not to be undone by any action of the Holy See. Well, that included the following interesting fact. Shortly after this Assembly of 1682, Louis XIV declared that he had the ability to control all communication between the Pope and the Catholics of France. No papal decision, decree, bull, definition could have any authority in France without the king's okay. Hmm? And this is the kind of thing that Article 3 of 1682 is trying to preserve. The fourth Gallican article, although the Pope has the principal part in questions of faith and decrees regarding the whole church, and over each church in particular, nevertheless, his judgment is not irreformable, at least without the consent of the church. Okay? Now there is a specific point that Vatican I was out to reject. Okay? The actions of the Holy See were not irreformable of themselves, but only thanks to the consent of the church. That would include the whole church. That would include the Church of France. And the Church of France couldn't do anything that would displease the King of France. Right. 
And so basically this meant that nothing the Pope decided could become law or bind consciences in France apart from the royal okay. Okay? Very nasty stuff. Our dogma, dogmatic constitution of Vatican I, the eternal shepherd, was designed to get rid of Gallicanism once and for all. After all, it was time to get rid of it because a little thing, very nasty thing in its own right, called the French Revolution had intervened. And there was no king of France at the time, at least none in office, none doing the job. And um, so Gallicanism was kind of without <laughs> one of its main sources of support. Um, still, there were Gallican theologians. I'm going to give you the name of the most prominent of them. He died in 1729. His name was T O U R. N E L Y, Tornelli. Okay. He wrote the textbooks of ecclesiology that were used in all the French seminaries from one end to the other of the 18th century and well into the 19th. And this guy was a defender of all four of those Gallican articles of 1682. So Gallicanism was living on. And in chapter 3, Vatican I defines that the Pope holds a worldwide primacy. The Roman Pontiff is the successor of Blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, true vicar of Christ, head of the whole church, and father and teacher of all Christian people. Now you think, well, that doesn't sound terribly controversial, but Tornelli had said that the Pope was not the vicar of Christ. He was the vicar of the church. Okay. Tornelli had this very interesting position, complicated, subtle. He said, the church has turned over, delegated all of its executive power to the Bishop of Rome. Okay. He is the ultimate law, the ultimate boss. The absolute monarch of the church. Okay? And so he must be obeyed. But he can be wrong. Okay? His decrees are not irreformable of themselves. He can be wrong. He's not infallible. He's just the boss, that's all. He's where the buck stops. And you have to pay, obey him even when you're wrong, even when he's wrong, just as you had to obey Louis XV that cretin. All right. Next. The Roman church possesses a preeminence of ordinary power over every other church, and it's both episcopal and immediate. There had been Gallican theorists who denied that. It's episcopal and immediate. This by no means detracts, says Vatican I, from that ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops who have succeeded to the place of the apostles tend and govern individually the particular flocks that have been assigned to them. Next paragraph. This is still chapter 3. It follows from that supreme power that the Roman pontiff has the right, dot, 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 to communicate freely with the pastors and flocks of the entire church so that they may be taught and guided by him in the way of salvation. Therefore, we condemn and reject the opinions of those who hold that this communication of the supreme head with pastors and flocks may be lawfully obstructed. We condemn the idea that that communication can be lawfully obstructed. Or that it should be dependent on the civil power, which leads some people to maintain that what is determined by the apostolic see 
considering the government of the church has no force or effect unless it's confirmed by the agreement of civil authority. Okay? Direct blow against Gallicanism. Next, if anyone says the Roman pontiff has merely an office of supervision and guidance, but not the full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the whole church, or that he has only the principal part, but not the fullness of this power of jurisdiction. Let him be anathema. Okay? So there uh, is uh, Gallican Article 4, struck down. And uh, finally, at the very end of this first dogmatic constitution on the church, on which Vatican II will build, as we will see. The council defines as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, dot, 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 he possesses by the divine assistance promised to him in Blessed Peter that infallibility which the divine redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith and morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves and not by consent of the church, irreformable. Of themselves, they're irreformable. Not by the subsequent consent of the church. We have all lived through an episode that should make us all very glad that this point was nailed down with big nails and firm hammer blows in 1870. We have all lived through the aftermath of Paul VI's encyclical Humani Vitae. Yeah. He resolved it in a way that many bishops throughout the world didn't like. Because there were all kinds of lay people all over the world who got tired of the idea that hanging up diapers was hanging up victory banners for Jesus. They didn't want to have more children. They wanted birth control to be licit. Okay? God forbid they should have to abstain from time to time. Unthinkable. No. They wanted all the joys of matrimony, no abstinence whatsoever, and contraception as the, the preventative of conception. And there were Episcopal conferences in Canada, in several European countries that frankly said, well, Humani Vitae uh, is uh, hmm, the Pope's opinion, but uh, we don't agree, we don't quite, you know, we think it's up to conscience. And, and, yeah. There was a perfect example of a papal teaching formally resolving a debated issue. Okay. And it did not get the universal consensus of the church agreeing to it. Okay. Did that make it a non-doctrine? Charlie Curran thought so. But Charlie Curran had forgotten his long ago reading of Vatican I. We shall not forget. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshner. Our usual uh, break. You have to understand, I'm an engineer, not a history major, so I'll yeah. try this question. Uh, it, if Humana Vitae was kind of the finger in the dike that prevented perhaps or helped the Catholic Church not to go in the direction that the Episcopals, the others, went, yeah. uh, and Humana Vitae was uh, published under Paul VI, then wh where is the objection to him? I don't know if I understood it, that's all. Oh, um the issuance of the encyclical Humani Vitae is one of the great acts of his pontificate. Uh, and he did many other, put out many other wonderful teaching acts as well. That catechism of the people of God, etc., etc. My complaint about him is that he spent all of his time reading theology books and not governing the church. Okay. He let too many messy situations get out of hand. He had ruled, for example, against communion in the hand. The American bishop said, we're going to introduce it anyway. 
And Paul was six and, well, hmm, yeah, well, hmm, be that way. Now, he, he, yeah, he needed to administer more. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just have a real bone to pick with popes who are great teachers and lackadaisical administrators. Somebody's got to clean curial house, you know what I mean? Never mind. Okay, I apologize in advance. It's been a while since I've studied this part of history. But I was wondering if you could speak on the effect on the French church uh, by Napoleon I's relationship with uh, Pope Pius and what happened to Gallicanism at that point after the revolution during the First Empire and maybe uh, a bit on Napoleon III and his relationship with the church. Well, I can give you a very quick answer to that. Uh, when Napoleon moved to regularize the situation of the church in France, he insisted upon restoring the full set of Gallican articles. Okay, so that was part of the restoration. Uh, so uh, Napoleon did not make any kind of a dent at all in Gallicanism. It's just that it, it would no longer be. Uh, uh, a Capetian or a Bourbon who would enjoy these privileges. It would be uh, L'Empereur. Yeah. When someone is said to be anathema, does that mean excommunicated? Uh, not literally. I mean, if you want to say you're excommunicated in Latin, you say excommunicatus es. Thou art. Excommunicated. Anathema means sort of which we give up. We give up on them. You know, we give them up to their own devices. We can't do any more with them. Dr. Marshner, I wasn't yeah. quite clear when you said the church had indirect authority. Were you speaking of individual bishops, or is the church embodied in the Holy Father both. having the indirect authority? Both. Both? Yeah. Both an individual bishop in his see, in a, if he gets into a contest with some sort of local magistrate, and the Holy See itself, if he gets in the context with, into a battle of some kind with the head of state. Um, although the Holy See does not have authority to rule anybody's kingdom in this world, my kingdom is not of this world, said the Lord. Uh, nevertheless, political acts can come under ecclesiastical judgment by reason of some wrongness about those acts. Okay? And then the church can give a judgment which binds people in conscience. Okay? And, uh, you know, when things are good in Christendom, then the offending prince or monarch repents. You know, stands outside in the snow in bare feet, something nice like that, <laughs> repents. When things are bad, they don't repent, but take further action to try to make trouble for the church. But then the church can remove the obligation of their subjects to obey them. This is what, it was Sixtus V, wasn't it, who put out the, the bull reg, regnum in excelsis, regnans in excelsis, declaring that the loyalty of Catholics in England to Elizabeth was dissolved. Okay. Now, did he have the right, did he have the power to make such a judgment? Oh, sure. And Elizabeth's conduct amply justified some such move. The trouble is, it was so politically stupid. I mean, one cannot believe that he did this. Because it made, it, it gave Elizabeth the excuse to treat every Catholic in England as a traitor. They had all along professed their, their loyalty 
You know, even though your majesty smite us, we are your loyal subjects. Well, all of a sudden, the pope had said they could, ah, he could be a traitor. So she assumed, okay, they're all traitors now. The pope told them so. And the result, of course, was more vicious persecution. The indirect power is a delicate thing. You may have it, but it isn't always smart to use it. In fact, we have an example tonight. In the aftermath of the big French clergy meeting of 1682 that passed these, these, these four uh, uh, articles, what did Innocent XI do? What did the Pope at the time do? Huh? Did he approve of these articles? No, no, no. Did he pursue the matter with Louis XIV? No, no, no. It was time to back off and wait. I mean, after all, this whole mess had started over this little business about the revenues of vacancies. It just wasn't worth another major schism. You know, let's not turn Louis XIV into another Henry VIII. Hmm? So the Holy See bided its time. And we saw, finally, its response to those articles in 1870. Just kept, just kept quiet about it. Most of your conversation to, um, this evening has been about in the realm of kings, kingdoms, whatnot. Fast forward to today, 140 years later, there's hardly any kings or kingdoms that are around. Right. Most of democratic uh, regimes. Right. But how does all of this play into, you know, in today's environment, we have, demo we, we have a lot of elected democracies as opposed to kings? Yeah. Well, I wish I could say that on the whole, the democracies are better behaved than the monarchs of old had been. There were theologians at the end of World War I who were dancing with joy because down had gone the Habsburgs in Austria, down had gone the Romanovs in Russia, and they had all had privileges and powers, and they persecu the Russians persecuted our church, and the Austrian emperor had certain vetoes on... Ay, ay, ay. We were finally rid of these people. But the 20th century did not turn out to be politically friendly to the church. Right? Not only Hitler and Stalin, but also lots of other authorities in lots of other countries uh, have felt that they had a right to restrain communication of the Holy See with their citizens. Okay? And... Um, we, we came close to that in the United States. The know-nothings, if they'd had their way, certainly would have prevented the Pope of Rome from communicating with American citizens, okay, unless it suited them. So, um, uh, um, for all of the aches and pains that came with having Catholicism as a religion of the, as the religion of the state. We have, learned, we have had to learn to live with another bunch of aches and pains uh, in states with no religion of the state and where they um, are not always careful of religious liberty. You know? So, I mean, the... The First Amendment is some protection, but um, there are worse things than an established national church. And perhaps radical secularization of the state will turn out to be a far worse thing. Uh, it, it's worthwhile to read over again the last couple of pages of John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae. That's where he talks about this claim that in a democracy we have to approve the will of the people, and if they want abortion, that's how we have to vote. Okay? And he has 
um, some interesting sentences on the point that um, the uh, moral truth is the bedrock of any sound political order. And you, uh, he's not about to allow that argument to go through. So anyway, is that it? Well, I, I actually have the final question here, Dr. Marshall. Oh. I'm going to allow myself a, a calm or two in, uh, in the middle. Um, you had said in a previous talk that reconciliation with the Orthodox is very much dependent upon our reading of Vatican I and whether we can read Vatican I in such a way or explain Vatican I in such a way that the Orthodox could swallow it. Um, to what extent are we to read an ecumenical council within its historical context in which it was originally dealing as Vatican I was, was with Gallicanism? Mm -hmm. To what extent does that same council teach us in our relationship with other problems that we face, such as reunion with the Orthodox? Well, it's a two-edged sword. Let's put it that way. On the one side, our success at Vatican I in getting rid of the last remnants of Gallicanism, Caesaropapism, and all that kind of stuff, was a great victory of independence for the church. Okay? The church um, condemned forms of subjection, which she, she had historically been under, even in certain very great Western countries. The Orthodox should be happy to see a thing like that, because they themselves have lived under very oppressive regimes. Okay? And I'm going back, going back to the Byzantine Empire. Um, and I, I, I don't just mean the, um, you know, the uh, iconoclast emperors. But our Orthodox emperors could be a pain in the neck. Heraclius being a perfect example. And there were others. Um, and, you know, it, it got to be the one job in the world you did not want. I don't care how ambitious you are. The one job in the world you did not want was Patriarch of Constantinople. Because as soon as the emperor looked askance at you, which he would do if the emperor's mistress looked askance at you, you were out of a job. The church in the East has always needed a level of political independence that we have enjoyed in the West, partly because of the independence of the papal states and partly because of the clarity of doctrine about the independence of Christ's um, establishment of the church from political constraints. Okay? On the other hand, this is the other blade, this is the bad side, if you want to put it that way, Vatican I makes it perfectly clear that in order to be in union with Rome, you must confess a primacy of jurisdiction. That, be, that excludes the idea of a mere primacy of honor. And all. Uh, it excludes the idea that popes and other bishops are basically equal. It excludes the idea that, sure, the five big patriarchal sees of the fourth century, that, that's, that's where it is. They all agree. These theories are gone, as far as we're concerned. And uh, the only thing we can do to hold out an olive branch to the east is pledge that in return for accepting Vatican I's definition, we will not extend to the East the kind of centralization of administration in Rome which we have done in the West. All right? For example, I mean, the Easterners were absolutely horrified by the idea that their own synods couldn't select bishops to replace ones who died. Um, the idea that you'd have to go to the Roman congregation for bishops. What? Well, nobody ever went to a Roman congregation for bishops in the West. 
in the 12th century, the 13th century, the 14th century. That, that kind of centralization of administration is part of the aftermath of the Reformation. I mean, every, everything that has been done to centralize more and more power in the Holy See has been done for good reason. But that doesn't mean that it's the right prescription for every part of the world. Okay? Um, I uh, certainly would be sad to see um, the Eastern Church's authority over their liturgy kicked upstairs to some Roman congregation for egalitarian language in liturgical texts or something. I don't, I don't want that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we'd, ha we'd have to say, look, the role of the Pope as Patriarch of the West has allowed him to exercise a great degree of administrative control here in the West. We, n we do not pretend that that level of control would be justified in the East. Thank you. Our topic tonight is the Pope and the bishops as presented in the document on the church from Vatican II. As you probably already know, the Vatican II document on the church goes by the name Lumen Gentium. Okay? And in my opinion, it is probably the finest single document to come out of Vatican II. Nevertheless, there are a great many preposterous claims that are made about it. It is alleged that there's some sort of big divide between the doctrine of the church at Vatican I and the doctrine at Vatican II. Okay? Prima facie evidence against that is the fact that at Vatican I, a complete schema, that's Latin for a draft, constitution on the church was drawn up. All that got promulgated in 1870 was one chapter of it, the chapter on the, uh, on the primacy of the Holy Father. But the rest of a complete schema on the church was drawn up, it dealt with the status of the church as the mystical body of Christ and as the, uh, the, the faithful people. Okay? All that language was in there. The point that bishops succeed to the apostles in their diocese by the same divine right as the pope succeeds to Peter in his diocese, was already in that draft prepared for Vatican I. Okay. So Vatican I was already prepared to condemn the idea that bishops succeed to the apostles only indirectly, as though via the pope as though Episcopal power was transferred by Christ first to the Pope and then through the Pope comes to the bishops. That would result in the idea that the bishops are like, um, uh, what would be a good word, lieutenants of the Pope or something like that. Absolute nonsense. Ready to be condemned at Vatican I. Many of those, well, at first, the whole draft schema on the church, De Ecclesia, prepared at Vatican I, was then criticized, the initial draft was criticized by the bishops at the council. Get this. 
This is Vatican, this is 1870. The first draft started to explain the nature of the church by seizing on the term the body of Christ and holding that as the central truth from which all the rest of the truth about the church could be derived. Okay? Guess what? The bishops at Vatican I didn't like that. Okay. They insisted that the, well, of course, the, the, the image of the body of Christ has to be used. I mean, it has, it's part of our doctrine. But they wanted to start out with a different quasi-defining statement. They wanted to start out with the statement that the church is the cetus fidelium Christi, the body or society of the believers, of the faithful in Christ. Which is a whole lot like people of God, isn't it? It's a very similar um, preference there at Vatican I for talking about the people of God before we get into the deep description uh, of the mystical body. All right. I have selections with me tonight from that complete schema prepared at Vatican I. As I say, there were criticisms of the first draft by the bishops. It was then completely revised and annotated. It was revised and annotated by a great hero of mine. He was Father Josef Kloit. Gen, E-U-T-G-E-N. He was an S-J. Yes, he was. Okay. He died in about 1885. But he was at Vatican I as a paritus and a member of the Central Theological Commission for the Editing of Documents. He wrote the annotations on the first draft and produced the second draft, right? I have a number of quotations with me tonight, if we have time, if you're curious about them, that I will be happy to read to you. And the similarity in wording between the second draft of 1870, prepared by Father Kloitgen, and the final wording in Vatican II is often remarkable. Okay? Now then, the reason for that similarity is not simply because the theologians and Paridi at Vatican II went back and read the material from Vatican I that hadn't actually been promulgated, though they did that too. The reason is that many parts of that second draft of a complete schema on the church were taken and put into encyclicals by Leo XIII. So he got them promulgated that way. Not as acts of the council, but as, well, encyclicals. Right? And uh, I'm going to name two encyclicals in particular. One is called Et Sane, E-T-S-A-N-E, which means and indeed. And the other one is called Satis Cognitum. Satis Cognitum, which means it's well enough known. Okay? Satis Cognitum. Parts of that draft were put into both of those encyclicals, and when you go through the footnotes of Lumen Gentium, please note how often those encyclicals are quoted. That's Kloitgen's draft from Vatican I coming into Vatican II via those intervening encyclicals. Oh, by the way, and a great deal that was in Satis Cognitum was repeated by Pius XII in uh, Mystici Corporis and in Mediator Dei. So the idea that there is some big break 
some theological revolution, some conceptual earthquake. Between Vatican I and Vatican II is absolute nonsense. Okay? Now let me lay to rest another myth. The claim is often made that Vatican II chose a different concept of the church from what had been used at Vatican I. Okay? Uh, Yves Congar, for example, an all too famous Dominican. Yves Congar, O period, P period is one of those who maintains that although the Council preserved to some extent the concept body of Christ, it really preferred and further developed a new concept called people of God. Okay. He thinks the originality of Vatican II lies in synthesizing those two concepts. Then there is another theologian, this time a German, my side of the Rhine, but he's even worse than Congar. This guy was named Kirsta. I forget right now his first name. That's an umlaut over the O, so it's not Koster, it's Kirsta. He maintains that uh, Vatican II has fully shifted to the concept people of God. That's the new central concept of the church. This has not been taught before. This is new. This is brilliant. This is new. This is revolutionary. Okay? Unfortunately, there are also theologians who maintain an other opinion or other opinions. For example, there is a guy, was a guy, named Otto S-E-M. M. E-L-R-O-T-H. Semmelroth. Who picks on a word in the very first paragraph or so of the document and says that Vatican II has initiated the great novelty of understanding the church as a sacrament. Sacrament. Now that word is in the text. What it in fact means, I will explain to you in a bit. But it's preposterous to maintain that this word that occurs basically once in the whole document is the, the new central concept of the church. Okay? Oh, and then there are the people, oh gee, this just drives me crazy. People said, no, 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 the real, the, the, the real heart of Vatican II is a deep idea common to the talk of the body of Christ and the talk of the people of God. It's the common idea of sharing. Now that sounds even better in Latin. It's communio. Yes. The church is a communio. A communion. Well, we talk about the communion of the saints. Well, it's not that strange a word. But um, I would like to know exactly what communio means if it doesn't mean a social belonging or a mystical incorporation into our Lord. If it's neither of those exactly, what is it? Now, I brought with me the very interesting first chapter of a very interesting book. It's called The Concept of the Church. It was published in 1981, and it was written by a chap named Hermann William Maria Reichhoff. R-I-K-H-O-F. Father Reichhoff. 
Get this. This book was a dissertation written under Edward Skilovex. Right? Who's hardly a saint of my devotion. When I think of Skilovex, I often think of very funny money ideas indeed. So when I saw that this book had been written under the direction of Skilovex, I thought, oh gosh, this is going to be awful. But in fact, it's wonderful. I couldn't believe it. The Concept of Church, subtitle, A Methodological Inquiry into the Use of Metaphors in Ecclesiology. Now, never mind all the complications that the subtitle may suggest. The first chapter of the book is devoted to looking at the successive drafts that were used at Vatican II. The first draft was handed to the Council Fathers already when the Council assembled. It had been uh, produced uh, already in 1960 and 61, working in the Curia. It was edited by Cardinal Ottaviani and presented to the Council. The bishops criticized that draft. The next draft was written by a French or Belgian, I'm not sure which, theologian. Father Gerard Philippe. Philippe with an S on the end. You know how French is. Half the letters are silent, especially at the end of a word. It's ridiculous. Gerard Philippe produced a second draft. Now, it has often been alleged that, oh, oh, that's where you see the radical novelty of Vatican II. Yeah, they, they got that schema prepared by the Curia and all. Yeah, but they, they quickly threw that out. Yeah, and they got this French guy or Belgian guy, whatever, to write this, this new draft, and that was accepted as the basis for further work. Okay. The idea that this was a revolutionary moment, however, is somewhat dimmed by the fact that Father Philippe's draft uses almost all of the text of the first draft, including whole chapters from the first draft. Okay? The main issue is, is, is in arrangement, order of covering topics. It's not a big difference of doctrine. Well, then Monsignor Philippe's draft was submitted to the bishops, kicked around some more, revised again, a second draft, and then there was yet a third draft, and that's the draft that was promulgated as Lumen Gentium. Okay. It had the title Lumen Gentium ever since the second draft. All right? So there was continuity between the drafts. A great deal from the curial draft one is still in Lumen Gentium. Surprisingly much. Now this guy Rykoff goes through the whole history of the debate over these drafts, what was in them, what was changed, what was different about them. And then he faces this question. Was there a shift at Vatican II? in the central concept of the church. And he comes to the conclusion, let me see if I can find this. Here we go, page 37 of his book. One cannot maintain that, quote, people of God, unquote, has replaced, quote, mystical body of Christ, unquote, as the central term. That was wonderful. In other words, the central claim is baloney. Anyone who studies the drafts will find that the central concept, if you want to call it that, remains the same. The traditional one. Okay? The only thing that is a little bit new with the final draft is that they, it gives a full survey of all the biblical images under which the church is presented. Okay? Not only people of God, but also the house of God, or the temple, thank you, kingdom, okay? the sheepfold, the flock, 
It goes through a discussion of all of those terms, each of which illuminating in its own way. But it certainly does not throw out mystical body in favor of people of God. And yet we have been told this, this was a central innovation of Vatican II because Vatican I was written back in 1870 when there were still kings and princes and tyrants ruling people and the church was against democracy and everything had to be uh, the thought of as a monarch with the po- monarchy with the pope at the head. But now, ha-ha, in the 20th century, the church came to terms with the modern world, recognizing the democratic potential of the term people of God. Okay? Since there is no theological shift from body of Christ to people of God, and no theological shift on the topic of papal primacy, as we will see in a minute, These claims that the church endorsed democracy in the church, in Lumen Gentium, is baloney. Did I end that sentence right? Claims, no, it's R. They are baloney. All right? So, do not believe what you read in journalists. Xavier Wren, of course, is a pseudonym. Don't believe what you read in these commentaries. They're not based on any serious scholarship. Okay? Now then, what I propose to do is start on my way through the text of Lumen Gentium, beginning in chapter 1, and then um, I'm going to hit chapters 7 and 8, and then we're going to hit chapter 14. We can't discuss the whole thing document is huge. We can hit some highlights and I want to use this opportunity to comment on uh, famous turns of phrase that come up in these early chapters. Right away in chapter 1, De Ecclesiae Mysterio, on the mystery of the church, we find this sentence. Since Christ is the light of the nations, this holy synod, called together in the Holy Spirit, strongly desires to enlighten all people with his brightness, which gleams over the face of the church by preaching the gospel to every creature. And since the church is in Christ as a sacrament or sign and instrument of intimate union with God and of all humanity, the council, continuing the teaching of previous councils, intends to declare with greater, greater clarity to the faithful and to the entire human race the nature of the church and its universal mission. All right. There's the occurrence of that term sacramentum, as it is in the Latin. Veluti sacramentum sells signum et instrumentum. Intime cum Deo unionis. The claim has been made that the choice of this word uh, means that uh, the old list of seven sacraments is somehow now seen to be incomplete. We forgot one, the church. The claim is made that somehow... uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the church fulfills the classical definition of a sacrament, and, and therefore that's the right way to understand it, because it's a visible thing that communicates grace. Huh? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Would you believe none of that is true? What the council is doing here is going back to the old-fashioned use of the word sacramentum. Let's get one little piece of history under our belts. The word sacrament acquired its modern technical sense in the 11th century. Yeah, 
in the work of Peter Lombard. Okay? Peter Lombard took the idea of a sign and the idea of a cause and fused them together and said a sacrament, properly so called, is a, not just a sign of grace, but a cause of what it signifies. Okay? Thus far, Peter Lombard. Prior to his time, the word sacrament was used much more broadly, and here is why. In... Um, <clears throat> the first, second, third, fourth centuries of our era. The Romans were concerned about keeping their language free of foreign words. They were never as bad as the French, you know, with their academy and their La Russe, but it, 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 the Latins were pretty sensitive about this. And so they would not use the word, here we go, M-Y-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, mysterion. They didn't want to use it. It's a Greek word. Okay. They wanted to translate it into Latin. Okay. They tried to use and be satisfied with the Latin word arcanum. Arcanum. Which means a secret. Okay? You've heard the word arcane. Okay? Hidden secret. And that is one of the one of the meanings of mysterion in Greek. But it's it just didn't have the right feel. Okay? So they were dissatisfied with that translation. And instead, they came up with a word that had use in connection with dedicating gifts in temples and making pledges to temples. That word was sacramentum. And that is the word that stuck in Latin. Sacramentum. And so, in the early centuries, indeed, until the time of Peter Lombard and the High Middle Ages, sacramentum was simply the translation of the Greek word mysterion, which means mystery. So anything that you can call a mystery you can call a sacramentum. All right? So, the fathers of the church often said that our incarnate Lord is a sacramentum. Sure. Because there's more to him than meets the eye. We have a proper definition of the term mystery in uh, St. John Chrysostom. He says, wherever you have something that looks one way to the unbeliever, but another way to the believer, because the believer sees something the unbeliever doesn't, you have a mysterion. Okay? All right. That'll fit baptism. An unbeliever looks at it and he thinks, bunch of water. We look at it and we see the cleansing of the soul. So baptism is a mysterion, a mystery. So is our Lord. Okay? People all over Palestine looked at him and said, here comes that rabble-rousing rabbi again. The authorities will soon make short work of him. Okay. They weren't seeing what faith sees in Christ. Yes? His hidden divinity. Well, by that standard, come on, is the church a mystery? Of course it is. The church is observed by unbelievers throughout the world, belonging to various Christian, quote-unquote, denominations, belonging to various other religions, and the world is full of venom 
against this reactionary force of oppression and darkness. And, uh, what did uh, Voltaire say about it? She's an infamy. She's an infamy. Crush the infamy. Écrasez l'infamy, said Voltaire about the Catholic Church. And of course, we've been called the Antichrist and, well, you know, the full range of abusive terminology. So the world sees the church. But do they see, those people in the world, all that's there to be seen? No, they don't. They don't see her divine status by virtue of institution. They don't see that she has Christ as her head. They don't see that we are knitted to Christ in the church through supernatural gifts, do they? So they think of the church as just a political or economic force. And so they often think they can wipe us out. Right. In that sense, obviously, the church is a mystery. And hence can be called a sacramentum in Latin. And if, we, if you want to try to introduce that archaic use of the word into English, yeah, fine, go ahead call the church a sacrament, but know what you're saying. You're just saying it's a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery, right? The Incarnation is a mystery? Yeah. Heck, according to the fathers of the church, the, the symbolical pages of Holy Scripture are mysteria. Like the, the, the um, Song of Songs? Okay. The unbeliever looks at that book and says, oh, red-hot love poetry here. Horny Hebrews, no, no, no. Okay? The believer reads that book and sees the dialogue of affection between God and his church. Yes? Mm -hmm. We see what they don't. So that's what a mystery is. That's what mysterion meant. That's what sacramentum originally meant. And that is all it means here on the first page of Lumen Gentium. It does not mean that the church is literally a cause of grace. Nor is she literally a sign of grace. Okay? When people call the, 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 the church a, 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 a great sign, she's not because she's a sign. Then they try to say, sign of what? Sign of God's un being united with man in some way? Well, okay, that's a sort of unorthodox answer. But Skillebex's answer is, the church is a sign of dialogue. How do you like that? Yes. Sign of dialogue. My goodness. It's not a clear sign of anything. And it is certainly not a cause of grace. How does the church produce grace in anybody's soul? By performing one of the seven sacraments, right? By baptizing people. By giving them the Eucharist. By chrismating them. Yeah. Those are causes of grace. Not the church itself, for heaven's sake. So the idea that you can take the technical sense of the word and apply it to the church is ridiculous. And Father Otto Semmelroth should have been fired from the International Fellowship of Theologians. Okay. Just incompetent. All right, I go on to my next issue. I'm now at the beginning of chapter 2. No, no, it's not chapter 2, it's just paragraph 2 in chapter 1. The Eternal Father, by a completely free and mysterious design of his wisdom, created the whole world. He decided to raise human beings to share in the divine life. And when in Adam they fell, he did not abandon them, but provided them always with the means of salvation, having in view Christ the Redeemer, who is the, the image of the invisible God, first, 
firstborn of all creation. That sentence is, in fact, the first sentence of the curial draft. Taken over completely and put in a very prominent place. All right. The only thing that is um, a little bit different from the curial draft to the final promulgated document <clears throat> is following reflection on the salvation historical context of the church. Listen to this. All those chosen before time began, the Father foreknew and predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's Romans 8.29. All those who believe in Christ, he decided to call together within Holy Church, which right from the beginning of the world had been foreshadowed had been foreshadowed, then wonderfully prepared in the history of the people of Israel and in the Old Covenant, established in these last times and made manifest through the outpouring of the Spirit. It will reach its glorious completion at the end of time. Then, as we read in the Holy Fathers, all the just... From the beginning, quote, from Abel, the just, right to the last of the elect, will be gathered together in the universal church in the Father's presence. Okay? So the church was foreshadowed from the very beginning. This is probably an allusion to the verse in Genesis. Satan will try to bite the woman's heel, the woman will crush his head, yes. Or the seed will crush, woman will crush his head, depending on how the grammar goes there. Foreshadowed from the beginning, but then prepared in the people of Israel. That's the church of the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, the people of God in the Old Testament is called the Ecclesia Dei, well, Ecclesia to Theu in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's in the book of Numbers. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> we can think of the church very sensibly, and you find this, this is not new, you can find this in Aquinas, for heaven's sake. And in the fathers, long before that, let's put it this way. You can think of the church at various widths in the temporal dimension of time. Okay? Let's start with the cross here in the middle, descent of the Holy Spirit and so on, and go on. (coughs) Obviously... The church, uh, 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 born on Pentecost in some sense, and centered on our Lord, will go on to the end of time, to the general resurrection. But you get different widths if you consider antecedents. The church, in the narrow sense, begins with Christ, the apostles, the crucifixion, Pentecost. But there is a wider sense that goes back to Moses. Okay? The people of God is organized at Mount Sinai. That's what's called the Ecclesia to Theu, the Kahal Adonai. You have to gargle when you try to speak Hebrew. Kahal Adonai, the, the congregation of God. Okay? And there's a still wider perspective. You can go back to the call of Abraham. 
And there's a still wider perspective that goes all the way back to righteous Abel. This broadest perspective was called Ecclesia Ab Abel. Okay? Perfectly traditional, all over the place in the Fathers, and it's in Aquinas, and so it's here. Nothing new about that. Okay? In just the same way, <clears throat> you can think of the church on a variety of levels in a second dimension. Let's call it altitude. Here on this line, we're dealing with the church in this world, what you might call the church militant. Under the New Testament, the Church of Christ, the Catholic Church, under the Old Testament, at least under conditions of history. But, if we go up a level, we can also think of the church as including those who have passed on into the next life. Yes. Like the, um, uh, the suffering church in purgatory, but preferably think about the church triumphant. All right? So let's put that up here as a higher level. Seen at a higher level... The church includes not only members on earth, but also members in heaven. When you get to heaven, you don't leave the church after all. You become part of the church triumphant. Yes? But at this level, every member of the church is still a human being. Some are saints in heaven. Some are suffering purgation, some are still alive in this world. But every member of the church is a human being. At this level, you can think of the church in contrast to our Lord himself. He's the head, and this whole thing is the body. But especially this, the New Testament church, is his body. <clears throat> head versus body, that's a contrast. Go up one more level, and the church will include divine members. Oh, why not? Let's have the angels in there, too. All right? Let's go all the way up to the highest possible level, where you have the totus Christus head and members. You see what I'm saying? Aquinas has a, uh, has a uh, rather dense uh, chapter in the uh, third part of the Summa where he works all of this out. All these different senses of the church that were known to him, he inherited them all from the church fathers. And all that we're getting at Vatican II is a hint of that tradition. We can see the church is prefigured or prepared all the way back in time. And we can look at the church either as Christ's bride, in contrast with him, or his body, in contrast with the head, or we can look at the church as the whole Christ, head and members. Right? All right. I am going to skip now over a great many details. I'm now in uh, paragraph 4 of section 1. The Holy Spirit leads the church into all truth, and he makes it one fellowship in ministry, instructing and directing it through a diversity of gifts, both hierarchical and charismatic. In other words, office in the church. Episcopate, apostolate, these also are gift. These also are um, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's no contrast to be drawn between the church as a hierarchical society governed by the priests and the bishops on the one hand, and the church as a sort of a 
charismatic thing filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, Vatican II says repeatedly they're the same. No difference. No distinction. I have a clear statement of that further on, but here it is already in paragraph 4. All right, in chapter 7, I'm sorry, paragraph 7 in chapter 1, we get the term mystical body. Here it is, still in full swing. The Son of God, in the human nature he had united to himself, overcame death by his own death and resurrection, and in this way redeemed humanity, made it a new creation. And by the communication of his spirit, he constituted his sisters and brothers, gathered from all nations, as his own what? Mystical body. There it is. Then there are four more paragraphs about the term mystical body. It hasn't been thrown out at all. And uh, remember that that was the, the key idea in the very first draft at Vatican I. Nothing has been lost. It's all just brought forward. And among the various gifts, I'm now in uh, paragraph 7. <clears throat> there is one spirit who distributes his various gifts for the good of the church according to his own riches and needs of the ministries. Among these gifts, the grace of the apostles holds first place. So the gifts are not all equal. So thanks to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the church is an ordered society. Hierarchical society. I go on. All right, I'm now in paragraph 8. I love this. This society, however, equipped with hierarchical structures and the mystical body of Christ, a visible assembly and a spiritual community, an earthly church and a church enriched with heavenly gifts, must not be considered as two things but as forming one complex reality comprising a human and divine element. Okay. Therefore, says Vatican II, by no mean analogy is the church likened to the mystery of the incarnate word, just as the assumed human nature serves the divine word. In a similar way, the social structure of the church serves the spirit of Christ. Okay? Now then, uh, there are all kinds of um, pretentious theologians. Pretentious. All over the European continent, for the most part, who think that this way of looking at the church on the analogy of the incarnation. You know, the visible part, the human part, plus the divine part. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a bad thing. That's, that's the Christus prolongatus view of the church. As though the church were the incarnation prolonged and continued in the world. Well, first of all, it's only an analogy. Nobody said otherwise. And second of all, what's the matter with it? It's perfectly good theology. Okay? Perfectly good. Okay. Now then, I go to the next part of the same paragraph. This is the unique Church of Christ, which in the Creed we profess to be one holy Catholic and apostolic. After his resurrection, our Savior gave the Church to Peter to feed. And to him and the other apostles, he committed the Church to be governed and spread. And he set it up for all time as the pillar and foundation of the truth. This church set up as an organized society in this world subsists in the Catholic Church governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. 
There you go. Now then, if you go back and read the encyclical of Pius XII, Mr. Chicorporis, you will find in that famous document an identity statement. It says the mystical body is the hierarchically organized Roman Catholic Church, the visible society on earth. It's an is there, is of identity. All right? Vatican II says that the church defined in mystical body terms subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. And I know people who think that is a big deal. Okay, big deal. As though the church were backing away from the identity claim. It's complete nonsense. I found the identity claim later on in the document. The one is the other. It's in there in black and white. But more importantly, there's a merit to using this term, subsist it in, subsists in. I don't want to give any of you painful memories, but I was down here a year or two ago and I was talking about the mystery of the incarnation and I talked a lot about subsistence. Yeah, that was a rough night or two. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into that delicious metaphysics again. Let's... Let's simplify the discussion by putting it this way. What is it to subsist? Okay. Number one, it's to be a whole thing, never a part. Okay. And it's to be a concrete thing, never abstract. A subsisting thing is a concrete whole. Okay. As opposed to a paper organization as opposed to some vague concept. A subsisting thing is a concrete thing. Okay. Heat is a quality that we find in bodies. Matter of uh, molecular motion, huh? Heat does not subsist anywhere. If it did, you'd have some being that was pure heat and nothing but heat. To the best of my knowledge, that doesn't exist. I used to think fire was subsisting heat. It's not. I asked a buddy of mine, well, if fire isn't subsisting heat, what exactly is it? And he looked, gave me a funny look and he said, it's soot. <laughs> ah! It's glowing particles coming off the wood. It's glowing soot. When it gets high enough, it turns to smoke and you, it's not glowing anymore. It's the same stuff. Anyway, I, I'll give you another illustration. You get on the bus, okay? You can sit next to somebody who subsists, okay? But you cannot sit next to human nature. It doesn't subsist. It can't occupy a chair. It's not concrete. Suppose your wife came to you, or your husband, okay girls, suppose your spouse came to you in late November and said, all I want for Christmas is some green. Oh, I get it. You don't want, to, want me to go shopping. You just want to give me money. You want greenbacks, dollars. And she said, no, no, not money. I just want green. Oh, well, I, I, I get it. Uh, you want the house repainted. <laughs> Inside, outside, it's gonna, place is going to look like a permanent St. Patrick's Day. Is that what you want? She says, no, I don't mean walls are painted. I just, I just want green. Could you give her or him such a present? No. Because the color green is not a subsisting thing. 
I could give her a green wall, that subsists. I could give her a green back, that subsists. Green itself does not. Does everybody get the idea? So what we're saying is that the mystical body of Christ, the intimate union of man in society with the Son of God, is real, concrete, in exactly one place. And you're in it. Congratulations to all you Catholics. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us sinners. Now at the hour of our death. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshner. As usual, we will take a, a short break. Dr. Marshner mentioned that um, it's an improper understanding of the power of the episcopacy to understand it in the sense of the bishops being lieutenants of the pope. But Vatican I states that the pope has the fullness of power. How are we to understand the right relationship between the power of the episcopate and the power of the papacy? Sure. Well, the bishop has full authority to run his diocese. But the bishop is accountable. Just as a suffragan bishop is accountable to his metropolitan. Okay. So also every bishop in the world is accountable to the Holy Father for his stewardship. It doesn't mean that he's simply doing the handiwork of the Pope, but it does mean that there is an authority, an authoritative judge, okay, even in this life. And that is a very good thing because I didn't know about you, but I can think of so many bishops over the course of my brief life that I would have liked to see removed. Uh -huh. Taken out of their dioceses, given chaplaincy in a nice little leper colony somewhere. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the, the bishop in his diocese is the successor of the apostles there by divine law just as much as the Pope is the successor of Peter by divine law. All right, I got that right here in paragraph, um, yeah, section 20, section 20 of chapter 1. Just as the office that was given individually by the Lord to Peter, is permanent and meant to be handed on to his successors, so also the office of the apostles, nourishing the church, is a permanent one that is to be carried out without interruption by the sacred order of bishops. Therefore, the synod teaches that by divine institution. The bishops have succeeded to the place of the apostles as shepherds of the church, and the one who hears them, hears Christ. And whoever rejects them, rejects Christ. Okay? There it is. So these men are in authority in their diocese by divine right. The only um, aspect of church practice that makes them seem like lieutenants of the Pope is the now common practice of having um, new bishops nominated or appointed uh, by a curial congregation, the Congregation for Bishops. Nominations come from the diocese, go to the curial congregation, uh, the curia uh, picks somebody, Maybe the Pope knows about it, maybe he doesn't exactly, 
Anyway, uh, the choice is, is made there, and then all that has to happen is that neighboring bishops actually come and consecrate the man. Then he's made a bishop. Remember, appointment from Rome doesn't make you a bishop. Okay. It means that you're the one who should be made a bishop. But it doesn't make you a bishop. For that, you need the laying on of hands of brother bishops. All right? Now, um, this custom of having candidates um, for the episcopate uh, looked over by a central Roman authority is relatively modern. It did not exist in the Middle Ages. It certainly did not exist in the ancient world. In the ancient world, particular um, uh, churches um, uh, chose whom they wanted for a bishop, or their metropolitan was involved in the choice. And then uh, once the ch- sometimes it was acclamation by the people. Okay, this is the man. Remember why Saint Augustine was afraid to travel much? He knew the people wanted to make him a bishop. He'd published a book. He didn't want to be a bishop. A heck of a job. He thought Hippo was safe. (laughs) Little did he know that shortly before he got there, the reigning bishop had died. Okay? And he was surrounded by people screaming, You're the one! (sighs) Yeah. Okay. So other bishops are brought in, and he's made a bishop. And the only involvement of Rome was, Rome would be told about it after the event. The Patriarchate of Antioch would be filled by local procedures and local bishops consecrating, and then Rome would be told. So the importance of the bond of unity with the Holy See was not denied. It's just that the bureaucratic arrangement we have now was not in place. I wish, sincerely, that I could think of this bureaucratic arrangement as entirely bad. Okay, I wish. But I'm an American. I have seen our hierarchy in action. I used to be a reporter and go to the national bishops meetings, the NCCB or whatever it was called in those days, and yeah... And, um, you know, if, if Rome didn't have any say in who those guys picked, they would be worse than they are now. I remember a brief period, not brief enough, when... Um, our apostolic delegate in this country was Archbishop Jean Jadot. Okay. We thought that the Episcopate might be getting a bit better. We had a couple of conservative nominations and consecrations, and then Jadot came along, and the American hierarchy went straight downhill. It was bad. But that was years ago. Yeah, well, all right. Well, how much better is the situation now? You know, if we're going to restore the rights of particular churches to nominate for their bishop and arrange for the consecration without going through Rome first, if we're going to restore that, then first we have to restore to our sees, bishops educated in theology. Not brick-and-mortar experts who don't know anything about theology but canon law. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's difficult. It's, you know, the, the old ways sound nice, and more decentralized, more organic, and so on. Yeah, but getting back to them isn't easy as a practical matter. Okay. Oh, one more thing. 
about the distinction between the bishop acting on his own in his own diocese, where he acts by divine law, eh? and bishops acting together in groups, collegially, okay, in, let's say, national conferences, or local councils, or whatever. Get this sentence from Vatican I. This is emphasized again in the Nota Pravia that was uh, approved, uh, by, uh, added by uh, Paul VI. The college or body of bishops does not have authority unless this is understood in terms of union with the Roman pontiff. Peter's successor as its head. All right. And then the collegial power can be exercised by the bishops throughout the world in union with the Pope, provided that the head of the college calls them to collegial action. The head of the college is the Pope. Calls them to collegial action, or at least approves of, or willingly accepts the united action of the dispersed bishops in such a way that the result is a truly collegial act. Okay. This heads off the possibility of bishops in a given region getting together and simply declaring themselves the local collegium we're all very collegial around here, and then starting to put out statements and pretend that these are exercises of the magisterium. Okay? You don't want that. We have seen that. Some of you are not old enough to remember this, but I am getting long in the tooth. I remember the days when the U.S. Catholic Conference was riding high and putting out these statements. Oh, they were going to address the the crises of the modern world with vim, vigor, and uh, evangelical authority, prophetic. And so we were told all about the attitude we had to have towards the strike at the Hagar Pants Factory. Okay. Well, I don't know how much they chuckled over that in Rome. But when that same local clique of bishops put out what they said was a pastoral document on atomic weapons, okay, and conceded that, well, you could sort of have them, but you couldn't use them, okay, Rome intervened and said, look, national episcopal conferences are not magisterial bodies. These statements they put out are not collegial acts the way the acts of an approved local council would be. Okay? So let's not... uh, This is a perfect example of what's meant here. Collegial action, or allegedly collegial action by bishops, has to be at least approved or tolerated by Rome. And the the only problem I can see is that sometimes Rome has just tolerated too much. Okay? Uh, In the time of Paul VI, I think I told you this last week, he condemned communion in the hand. All right? The American bishops turned around and said, we're going to institute it anyway. Because there's such a demand for it. Manufactured demand. Well, anyway... There was such a large demand for it. I'm not particularly against it, but I'm just talking about the process here. They said, well, we're going to do it anyway. And Paul VI, he just put up with it. So anyway, that's enough. I think that's it. That's enough. Thank you very much, Dr. Mercer. (laughs)